Hey everybody, today we're making a video on what does it take to make salami. We've had some requests out there that, uh, that you guys have asked me, you know, can you make a video on the ins and outs, the behind the scenes, the equipment, so on and so forth. Well, that's what this is going to be all about. So if you've ever considered or thought about making salami, these are the things that you're going to need to get in order for you to get started. So here we go. First thing you need is something called Mold 600. Now I'm going to be moving quite quickly because there's a lot to cover, but just bear with me on this. Mold 600 is Penicillium nalgiovensis, and it offers protection and benefits to your salami. It's that white mold that grows on the outside. Next, you're going to want to get your hands on some starter cultures. The starter cultures that are available all do their own unique things to the meat. Bottom line, it keeps your meat safe from unwanted bacteria. So whether you're trying to achieve fast fermentation or slow fermentation, it, that's up to you. You want to make sure you pick the right starter culture for the right kind of salami that you're going to be making. Depending on your salami, get some spices. Truth be told, all you need is a little salt and pepper, but if you want to get crazy, get some fresh whole spices and that way you can make a lot of different options. Also, you might want to get a spice grinder. This is actually just a coffee bean grinder and that works great too. Now we come to scales. Scales are incredibly important and I couldn't imagine doing this without accurate scales. And We have scales that measure up to 50 pounds and some that measure up to 2 pounds. And so these two right here, this Mettler Toledo, this only measures up to 2 pounds and we almost exclusively use it to weigh out our seasonings. So it's accurate to the 100th of a gram and we're able to actually uh, get a very precise measurement on our cultures and our cures so that we have a consistent product every time that we make it. Good scales are calibrated. They'll set you back a bit, but good equipment will last you forever. Next, you want to get a meat grinder. Meat grinders are incredibly important. Having the opportunity to not only grind your own meat, but select the, the size of the grind that you want. So get the accessories that typically come with the meat grinder. You can get a KitchenAid meat grinder. This is an LEM number 22 big bite grinder. We've had it for about four years and we've made an extraordinary amount of sausages and salamis with it and it's never once failed us. It works fast, it keeps everything nice and smooth, all the blades are sharp and uh, we highly recommend it. Matter of fact, if I had to do it again, I'd probably get the bigger one. But um, Cabela and Weston, they all make grinders that are quite similar to this one right here. If you do happen to use a KitchenAid, Notice that the small the, the motor is going to be smaller, so you're going to have to work in slightly smaller batches so that you ensure that your meat doesn't, uh, doesn't thaw or your fat doesn't smear. Next, we're coming to the mixers. LEM makes a 50-pound mixer, and although I love LEM, I don't particularly like their mixer very much. We do use it when we make humongous batches because it's just easier to mix that way, but um, you'll see here in a minute the one I prefer. The grinder, actually, the motor itself hooks up to the mixer and you allow it to mix for however long you want. I actually prefer for mixing my mints this stand mixer. I find that in about six minutes, this bad boy will get it to the right consistency, the texture, the, um, the, the meat just absolutely mixes beautifully. Everything gets incorporated. You can also use a stand mixer or a KitchenAid uh, kitchen mixer with the paddle attachment, or you can use your hands. <laughs> really, it's, uh, it's, it's, however you mix it is irrelevant. Now this actually is quite relevant. This is a sausage stuffing machine and, and you can get different sizes and shapes. You can get horizontal, you can get vertical. This particular one is a 25 pound sausage stuffer from the sausage maker. We've used it for, some, for quite some time and it's absolutely amazing. Um, you can get it motorized or you can get it with a manual crank and uh, highly recommend it. If you're going to be in the sausage or salami making uh, uh, hobby, then you definitely want to get something to, uh, to stuff your casings with. And you're also going to want to use some sort of sausage pricker, a brush, and some butcher's twine. And you can watch any one of my, my salami making videos to see how we use those. Next, you're going to want to get your hands on some casings. These are actually uh, hog casings, 32, 34 millimeter, but you can also get beef middles, you can get beef bungs, these are collagen middles, these are synthetic casings. And so where we live, it's quite challenging to get natural uh, beef or hog casings. And so we use a lot of synthetic casings and they work fine. So pick the right size, 
whether you're doing little snack sticks or whether you're doing you know pepperoni or uh, Genoa or something like that next you're gonna to want to get your hands on some cure prog powder this is cure number one sodium nitrite and it's used for anything that's gonna cure and dry in less than one month cure number one now you're gonna need cure number two cure number two is sodium nitrate it also has sodium nitrite as well as salt all mixed together and this is going to be used for anything that's going to cure and dry for longer than one month dextrose is an ingredient that you're going to need to feed your starter culture you see a lot of recipes call for some sort of a simple sugar this is a simple sugar and it's going to allow your starter culture to eat the sugar and produce lactic acid bacteria which keeps your salami safe okay now we come to a segment called fermentation chamber in this segment almost always gets overcomplicated. I, I want to keep it really simple. It's a box where you control the temperature and the humidity. And so you, this is a refrigerator in which the temperature and the humidity are controlled independent of the refrigerator. So there's things like temperature controls and, high, and, and humidity controls added to it. This is a wooden box in which, as you can see, salami is hanging and uh, the temperature and the humidity are controlled. This is an ice chest. It's an ingenious idea to ferment some little chubs. The humidity and temperature are controlled. Fermentation chambers are generally used for anywhere between 24 hours to 48 hours to 72 hours, depending on what you're fermenting. This is what I'm using right here. This is a smoker in which the, uh, the smoker is controlling the temperature because it's going down low enough, and I've got a humidifier inside of it. And so it doesn't matter what you use as long as you can control, remember, the temperature and the humidity. Now this is noteworthy. Often your fermentation chamber can also be your drying chamber. So depending on what you're fermenting, you don't necessarily need two different chambers. So that's something to think about. Once your salami is moving from fermentation to drying, you're going to need something to test the pH. That's how you're going to know it's ready. The entire purpose of the fermentation chamber is to allow the starter culture to ferment, to release that lactic acid, to lower the pH. And that's going to bring it into the safe zone. In order to do that, you're going to have to have something to read the pH. Now you can get pH strips, and if you do, your results aren't going to be as accurate, but at least it's a start. Get the pH strips that give you measurements between 4.5 and 5.5. Your safe zone is anything below 5.3. And you want to get very accurate. So if you want a very a, a tangy salami, like an American style salami, you're going to be in the 4.8s, 4.9s. But if you're going to want a more traditional European salami, you're going to be between 5.1 and 5.3. And so in order to do that accurately, to produce a consistent product, you really are going to need a meat probe that tests the pH. Now they range from $100 to about $450, depending on the model. This one's a HANA, but they, you know, Milwaukee Instruments makes a, makes a, a unit. And there's a lot, of, a lot of units out there on the, uh, on the market. Just do some shopping. Make sure you get all the different fluids to calibrate it. And, um, and read the instructions. They're fairly easy to use, but they are expensive and you don't want to break your unit. Now we come to drying. If you've made it this far, then you are on the home stretch. The hard work has been done and now it's just a waiting game. So welcome to the drying chamber and this is where it's getting fun. Now I'm going to make a later video to show you how to build a drying chamber, but just remember it's the same thing. A box in which you control the temperature and the humidity. This is one of our drying chambers and I want you to see it now. So right now, today, that's a refrigerator. Bam! Now it's a drying chamber. See the difference? I've added a couple little things and let me show you what I've added so that you can see what a drying chamber is all about. First thing you're going to need is some sort of a piece of equipment to control the humidity. That's what it is on the left. That unit is a hygrostat and in that you've got a humidifier plug to it and a dehumidifier plug to it so that controls the humidity the green unit is a temperature control and in that I've actually got the refrigerator itself plugged right into it next we're moving on to the humidifier and dehumidifier this dehumidifier is called the EvaDry 2200 and it sits in our larger chamber. Our larger chamber fits about 150 to 180 pounds of salami and this big boy does a lot of work 
It is large and takes up a lot of space, but it does control the humidity quite well. Their smaller unit, the Evadry 1100, was too small for the bigger chamber, the one you just saw, but it's perfect for a small refrigerator that has anywhere between 60 to 75 pounds of salami or sausage in it. So these two models, they both have their pros and cons. We think that they're appropriately sized for the small and the large chambers, so you got to be the judge on that. The humidifiers that we use are Cool Mist Ultrasonic Humidifiers. We found that the brands didn't really matter. The, you know, you want to try to get something that's compact and small. Uh, the only problem is, is that the smaller it is, the more you're having to fill it up. And so they all work relatively close to the same. All right, now we need to talk about books. Stanley maranaski has got a great book called The Art of Making Fermented Sausages. And then this one, Home Production of Quality Meats and Sausages. Also, Michael ruman has got a great book, Charcuterie, a different one called Salumi. These are all books that are going to give you some very basic pointers as well as some advanced level science behind the art of making salami. They're easy to read. There's a lot of instructions and a lot of recipes that you could follow so that you can hit the road running, starting with your most basic salami to some of the more complex ones. Well, that brings us to the end of the video, and I know that it sounds like a, a lot of stuff, but each one of these things plays a very important part in making high-quality, delicious salami. I first and foremost want to say thanks for watching. We are so very blessed to be able to pass on the information that we've acquired over the years of doing this to you. And so, if you got any questions, let me know. Click that subscribe button, and we'll talk later.